Good morning, folks. Glad to see everybody here um, after the party last night. I wasn't sure we were going to get a lot of people at 9 o'clock this morning. So uh, uh, happy to be here and happy to have all you here. So um, I'm Scott Hunter. Uh, if you've never met me or never heard of me, um, I've been at Microsoft for about 17 years, actually 18 in August. Um, and I've worked my entire career at Microsoft either on .NET um, or on parts of Azure. Um, um, I was part of the team that uh, rebooted .NET in 2014. Uh, we called it ASP.NET V5, ASP.NET 5, then ASP.NET VNX, then .NET Core. Um, and so excited to be here and talk about Aspire, which is the new cloud native framework that we just shipped um, back in build just a few weeks ago in May uh, in GA. So it's GA available today for anybody. Um, and let's get started on, on talking about Aspire. And so I hate all these words like cloud native. I was just talking to some folks yesterday, and they're like, what does cloud native mean? It means something different to everybody. Uh, the big thing that we think about is when you think of the word cloud native is it means your app is ready for the cloud. Um, the CNCF has this huge definition of what cloud native means uh, with too many words. Um, but there's a couple things in here that I, I do think are, that are important. There's a word called resilient. And that means your application can handle when the cloud wobbles a little bit. And we'll talk about that. Observable means you have great ability to go look at the telemetry that your application is producing. Um, I think scale is in here. I see microservices, containers, uh, a couple words in here. <laughs> um, but scalable, resilient, manageable, and observable are probably the big things that we care about uh, from that. And there they are, observability. This is um, the funny thing about most of the things that Aspire does is they've been in .NET for a long time. We just never turned a lot of them on. So observability, we had support for open telemetry a couple of versions ago, about two versions ago. Resiliency, as I said before, that is the ability for your app to actually handle a wobble and be OK. We first shipped that in ASP.NET Core 3.0. Um, scalability, that's just a cloud thing. And manageability is how do you actually manage all the resources, and uh, we'll talk about that as well. So Aspire has the ability to um, run containers locally. It has the ability to uh, create resources in, in, in the cloud. Uh, it can do all those things uh, very simply via code. This is the CNCF cloud native landscape. Our goal is not to make you have to worry about any of that stuff. That's way too much stuff. Um, and this is, as I said before, we shipped a lot of this tech before. Resiliency, ASP.NET Core 3, health checks, ASP.NET Core 3, observability, I want to say .NET 7 or 6. Um, and there's all these namespaces that you've probably never used before. And um, our job is to make you not have to worry about any of this stuff at all. Uh, this is feedback we got from our customers. Uh, nothing works together by default. As I said, none of this stuff's on. You have to go learn it and figure it all out. Um, every developer on my team needs to be an expert in networking, containers, telemetry. Uh, it's way too hard to, to do all that stuff. Um, and so that's, that's our goal, is to make this super simple. So we want to take the complex and make it simple, easy getting started, uh, give you a, a couple of choices, and big, big, big thing is having a paved path that you can control, and we'll talk about that. And so I'm about done with slides, so we'll just stop now. Too much. Um, so, as I mentioned, a lot of the things that we do in Aspire, we actually built in the product a long time ago, but they were just hidden features. Um, I was just talking to some folks in the, in the conference about a, a person at Microsoft, his name is Uli, um, and he is the person that if, if uh, anybody in the room is using Azure and you get really mad at us and you call Scott Guthrie, likely Uli will come and, and, and solve your problems. And he's been telling us for many years, Scott, you've got to make .NET do all the right things by default. Um, and so I want to take a, a, a trip back in time. I've got an old application that we actually demoed. Uh, Glenn Condron and I on, on the .NET team, we demoed this back in uh, ASP.NET Core three days. Um, and let's show, let me show the app real quick. So this is basically a, a stupid API app. And it's boring. It's the, it's the typical weather. You don't really care about this. Not super exciting. But we wanted to go and make sure that .NET was resilient. And so what we did is we wrote this fun middleware right here. Um, and we call this the random fail middleware. 
and it's important for me to use this to show Aspire today, what it, what it does is you hook this middleware into the ASP.NET Core pipeline, and uh, about half the time, it's just going to make an exception that says the computer says no. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go hook this into my app, because I want to show that, that um, we have resiliency. So we'll add the middleware, middleware to the app. I'm going to run it. And now, a bunch of times, I'm going to get these errors. Great. So I purposely made my app fail because I want to test that my client app is a really, is a really smart app. And so um, let's make this run. And once again, this is a fun part of, of why multi cloud native apps are hard in .NET today. I've got two projects here. I need to run them both at the same time. Um, and so we've got this kind of kludgy, kludgy thing here. I can do configure startup projects. I can say start without debugging on both of these. If you don't select that, it won't even run them. Um, and then what I have to do is I would literally go over here into my launch settings, find this IP address uh, and port, and I would come over here and I will come in here and I'll hard code that same uh, port and IP address. This is a fail. If I publish this app to the cloud, it'll never work because localhost has to be changed to something else. So this is one of the things we want to solve with Aspire is this. We're going to solve that right now. Um, what I want to do right now is just get the app running, make sure I'm in a good place. I am. Um, and so we'll run the same app again. And now I've got my front end app that calls the back end app. And you saw that the back end already failed once here. And so this app is going to crash a bunch of times. Another problem, when that app crashes, how would you know where that error was? Yet yeah, you could go to one of these terminal windows and go look and find those crashes. Not very helpful. Um, but to go back in time a little bit again, let's go fix this in ASP.NET Core 3. We're not actually using ASP.NET Core 3, but these features were all put in in ASP.NET Core 3. What I would actually do is I've already got Poly involved here, and this is the feature we added in ASP.NET Core 3. Oops. Um, I can go here and basically uh, you could add a retry policy. Who in the, in, the, in the room has ever used add transit HTTP error poly? Pro, uh, one, a few. So a few of you heard about this and, and ran this over time. Um, what this does is this sets a retry policy up for the app. And so if I run the app now, the errors won't happen because the front end application is just going to retry when that, when that failure happens. Uh, now I should, for the most part, this should work every single time. Errors are actually happening right now, but I don't even know that because we have no telemetry hooked to this at all. So let's go fix some of these problems um, with Aspire. So what I'm going to do is first off, let's turn this stuff off. We, uh, we don't need to use this anymore. That's off. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add Aspire to my project. And so one of the things you might be worried about is like, wow, I've already have all these, AP I have all these applications in .NET, and I don't want to rewrite them in Aspire. Is Aspire going to cause me to start over all my applications? The answer is no. You can actually add Aspire to your applications very easily. All you've got to do is right-click on any application you have, any, any ASP.NET Core application you have today. Um, there'll be an add. And you can add um, Aspire orchestration support right here. It's going to go look, ask me a couple questions. Um, and then a couple things are going to happen. So if I look at the project now, first off, we're no longer using that multi-startup. You can see my bolded project now is this random fail app host. And I've got this new random fail service default. So we added two new projects to my solution to make Aspire work. But before you even look at those, let's go look, what did it do to my, my, my API app? So I'm going to go over here. And there is now, at the top of this file, there is this new file, add service defaults. and. Uh, one of the reasons we didn't do Aspire earlier, we were afraid to go bake a bunch of stuff into, into, into ASP.NET Core. 
Um, one of the things that we learned from the web form days back in .NET Framework was turning a bunch of stuff on by default is confusing. Uh, people don't know how to turn it off or change it. Um, and so we, we want to add a bunch of defaults in an Aspire project, but we want to give you control of that. And because of that, you can see here I've got a random fail service defaults project here in my, in my code. So we give you the project. And you can go change that project however you want. If you don't like what we turn on by default, then go change it. So let's go back. And I'll just put a breakpoint on add service defaults. And I'll run the app. And let's see what we do by default. OK, so if I, if I trace into this, what I'm going to see is configure open telemetry. So we're turning on open telemetry. It's an open standard. A lot of almost all the diagnostic tools, services, products you can buy understand this, which means you can now connect all that stuff to your .NET application. The next thing is add default health checks. We built health checks into ASP.NET Core in version 3 as well. Um, and what health checks are is when you're in a container world, you're in an orchestration world, you're running into Kubernetes, uh, the cloud wants to be able to check and see if the app is actually healthy. And so you can write endpoints that the orchestrator will call. And if the orchestrator tries a few times and, and the app says I'm not healthy, it will restart the process. Um, and so these are on by default now as well. I'm not going to demo one today, but you have those. The next one, probably one of the most important things in, in the Aspire world, you saw when I opened up those launch settings.json, there was all those IP addresses and ports. That's terrible. I mean, I've had cases where um, I want to give something to a colleague and it doesn't work because all that stuff changes. If I want to publish this application to any cloud, that's not going to work because I need to change those to whatever the references are in my cloud. And so service discovery means we're not, you don't have to worry about the ports and the IPs anymore. We're going to give you a way of naming these things so you don't have to do that. And here is um, the one that uh, I was demoing before. Uh, and this is still using Poly. Uh, we're still using that open source library. But notice here it says, uh, configure HTTP, HTTP client defaults. This turns on that same Poly feature to do retries on my API for me automatically. Um, and we turn service, service discovery on in HTTP client as well. So that's that. And that's pretty much what we turn on by default. And you probably noticed as well, when the app booted up, um, I was in a dashboard. That's a new thing. Um, so the dashboard is the, the, the default project in, a, in an Aspire project. If I go back to my, my Visual Studio and I bring up the Solution Explorer, that default project is now the app host. That's what we call the orchestrator. So instead of having to have this start at multiple projects, now we say that's the one project that starts up and it boots up every other project, every other container, every other thing you might need for your project to actually work. So, um, and we'll, we'll take a look at that in just a second. Um, and I've got this dashboard. We know, we know a cloud native application is probably going to be more than one app. And uh, but, so that's why the dashboard is here. So you can see all the apps it's running. And right now I've only had one. I didn't add the other project yet. Um, but let's go back to the, uh, the browser. Um, it's got all the endpoints for the app. I can click that. Oh, I got, got the exception. Not surprising. I refresh. Got a good one. Refresh, refresh. Got the exception. If I go back to the dashboard, all that information is going to be available now. I can go to my structured logs. And there you see. You see all the errors in a clean way. You know, I can drill down in those errors. They're not very fun. You already saw what it's going to actually say. Uh, somewhere down here, you're going to say it's, it's going to say the uh, uh, computer threw an exception or the computer said no. If I scroll down somewhere in here, uh, we'll find that, that text down here. There you go. There's computer says no. And so finally, we've got a great place to go find those errors. Before those errors were happening, I had no, no idea to, to find those things. Even if I'm in the cloud, I would have no good, good way to do that. But let's take this to the next step. Let's go and stop the one project, not the single, all the, all the, all the projects. Um, now let's go add Aspire to my retry app. 
So I'll do the same thing. We'll add Aspire orchestration. It knows I've already got a host project in there. Um, and once again, you're going to see the same change happen over here. Uh, here's my add service defaults, which is why I will no longer need this add transit error policy because now I've got these re that, that resiliency is turned on by default with those services, those, those service defaults. I'm good. So we fixed that. But now let's go take a look at this app host. As I said before, this, this is the orchestrator for my app. Um, and you're going to notice here that what this does, it has a builder, very similar to the builder that you do in an ASP.NET Core project. But this is building for a distributed application. We know we're going to have more than one app. So I've got a, uh, a fail API and a retry app. That's kind of cool. But when I configured those startup projects earlier, I had to give it an order of when, which, which these things should start in. I want the API to be running before the front end so the front end doesn't crash. Well, I can do that here as well. I can take this and say API equals builder dot blah, blah, blah. And then I can say over here, we can co come, come down here and I'll just do with reference. And it always says with references, that's never going to work. Um, and there you go. So what, what, what have I done here is I have just told Aspire that I want you to boot the API up first because the uh, front end application depends on it. Now, I need to do something else as well. It doesn't matter for local development, but when I decide to put this in, the, in Azure, I'm going to have to do something more. Um, I can do uh, with external HP endpoints. And so what I've, what I've told this is, when I'm going to go to the cloud, I don't want the API to be public. It's just a regular API. I want my front end to be public, have a public IP address. So we're trying to make all the right security things happen in Aspire as well. So my API just stands by itself. I could go up there and add with external HP endpoints on the API, and that would make it make it public as well. But in this case, I don't really care about that. Um, now let's fix the last thing that we need to fix. Let's go back down to my retry app. And if you remember before, I've got this hard-coded IP address. I don't want that anymore. So what I'm going to do is let's go back and look at our program.cs. Notice that we give each of these things a name. Those names <clears throat> are what you need to use now. You don't have to worry about the IP addresses. And so my API is now just called fail API. And what I'll do is just come over here, get rid of all this awful junk. <clears throat> we'll call that fail API. And I can also get rid of this too. Doesn't matter in the cloud. <clears throat> and now we've actually aspired the entire application. So let's run it again. And now my dashboard <clears throat> is going to show both projects, um, which is good. And I can go click the URL to launch the project. Before we do that, how does the, AP, how does the front end get the IP address of the back end? How does that even work? So let's take a look at that. If I go here, I can click View on Details for my project. And when I do, it's going to show me all the things that you would be, it would be hard to show. I've actually written code in the past in my ASP.NET Core projects to go write all the environment variables to uh, a screen so I can find out what they are. In this case, I'm, I'm looking at all the environment variables, all the things we set up. <clears throat> but what's interesting here is if I scroll down here, you're going to see that what we've done is that name fail API, we create a special named version of environment variables where the orchestrator pops the IP addresses in. So when my API uh, tries to resolve the word fail API, it knows to resolve that to this. This is important because when I go to the cloud, I still use that fail API term, and we just inject different environment variables in uh, to whatever the endpoint is in the cloud. OK. So that means now, if I go back and I run my API again, or run, run my, my web app again, it's working, so it did all that, did all that work. And you're going to notice that it's, it should not crash. There was a pause there. Did not crash. Let's go look at the logs. 
And I can see some bad stuff happening here. Let's go, actually, let's go look here. This is more fun. Notice that you can see those failures were occurring. But the retry policy turned in and made those things work perfectly. If I wanted to, I can drill down in one of those things and it'll show you the entire call stack. It's like, hey, it called, it failed, it tried again, it succeeded, and it worked. And so, for, as I said, for the first time ever, I actually know the app's crashing, I know it's actually recovering, it's doing exactly what I want, um, and I would likely, if I would go debug this and figure out why is it failing and prevent this, but my customer's not seeing that. Um, I'm trying to inject the fakeness of the cloud having problems. Um, while we're in the dashboard, there's a bunch of other, other fun stuff here as well. I can go in metrics. Let's go look at my uh, retry, retry app. And for the first time ever, you can go look and see all the variables and all the stuff inside of Kestrel, how long things take, um, lots of telemetry that you never had before. It was always hidden somewhere that you never see. It's all public. So that's kind of cool. <clears throat> Let's do one more thing on this project. Okay, so we've got all the things the way I would want. I want to, I want to talk about the host project just a little bit more. Um, you know, I've got um, my, my two projects, but you can reference a lot of other things here as well. So if I, if I right-click on the host project, I'm not going to do the full hookup of this stuff, um, but there's another thing we add here as well. And uh, notice there's this new .NET Aspire package. And uh, this is not high-tech code. This is literally a filter in NuGet uh, of things that might be interesting uh, to you as an Aspire person. I'm going to laugh because sometimes it's not very happy. It's not even filtering right now. Maddie, fix it. Um, I'll try it again and see if it actually works. When in doubt, try again. There we go. Um, this time we, we see more stuff here. And as I said, I don't really, I'm not gonna do a lot here. What's interesting here, what, if I was gonna go add something like uh, Aspire Hosting Redis. So what you're gonna find in here, you're gonna find a variety of things. Notice there's Postgres, there's Dapper, there's Magic, there's RabbitMQ, there's SQL Server. Um, I don't know about anybody in the room, I hate installing stuff on my local machine. If I'm gonna go build an application that requires Postgres or Redis or even SQL Server, I don't want that on my machine. I, want, I, I, I like to own my machine and keep it clean. Um, and so one of the capabilities of, of Aspire is we have uh, packages for a lot of the most pop, pop, popular you know, tech out there uh, and we'll keep adding more. It's, a, it's an open source ecosystem. People can add their own as well. And what we'll do is we'll actually download a container and run that in a container for you so it doesn't actually have to pollute your local machine. So in this case, um, we'll just do, um, let's go back, and we can add the Redis here to my host. And then all I would do is go back to my program.cs after adding that, and now I can do things like So now I can basically add another dependency for my project. Okay, come on. And, and uh, what we'll do is we'll actually run that in a container for you uh, when, when that works. Um, and it wants a name here. Once again, one of the things in Aspire is I don't want to ever see a connection string anywhere in the project. Um, because those connection strings are going to change depending on if I'm running locally or in the cloud. And so I give everything a nice human readable name. And then I would come back over here and I would just do a with reference cache or Redis. And, dot. Um, and so now I've told 
Aspire, boot up the Redis, uh, boot up my API, and my retry app depends on all that stuff. If I run it again, now we're going to go actually make that Redis uh, happen as well. So there we go. I've got my cache. I've got my API. I've got my retry app. And once again, just like you saw before, how do we actually let the, the front end application get access to that Redis cache? If I come down here and do a view again, I like to show how this actually works to show it's not magic. There's no magic here at all. And I scroll down somewhere. Ah, here's a connection strings to cache. Once again, using what the term I called it, cache. So the Aspire tech knows how to take connection string to turn, turn the environment variable cache into the connection string. If I look, that's going to give me that endpoint to my uh, Redis running in a container. That's great. So let's, how would you publish one of these things to the cloud? And before I, I, I talk about publishing to the cloud, I want to be very, very clear. Um, Aspire is not a Azure technology. We make Aspire work with all the clouds. Um, if you uh, Google it, the folks at uh, AWS, they have built their own tech around publishing Aspire applications. Um, and so you can actually use th the same kind of stuff th the way I'm showing it with AWS, just like you can use it with Azure. And so I want to be very clear that we're not making Aspire an Azure feature. Um, literally, we've been partnering with uh, both AWS. We talked to GCP as well. Uh, on making sure that they, they all will support Aspire over time. And as I said, AWS is uh, currently ahead uh, of the, uh, the folks at Google. So let's go uh, to a command prompt. Let's actually stop the app. And what I want to do is I want to talk about publish. And uh, retry. What did I call this thing? Ah, random fail. So we, we, of course, do have, like we always do, we have a right-click feature in Visual Studio. In fact, I, I can quickly just show that. If I wanted to, um, I could right-click over here, and I could say Publish. And notice it knows that uh, it's an Aspire project, and it'll publish to an Azure Container app. I want to show you how that actually works underneath the covers. So my team uh, at Microsoft builds a tool called AZD. It stands for Azure Developer CLI. Um, and it's a tool that is used for publishing samples and projects and stuff like that. And it's aware of Aspire. Um, and you might ask, well, Scott, if you wrote this AZD tool, how could AWS build a tool? So one of the things, if, you, if I dig through the folders here, we create a manifest when you build an Aspire project. And any, 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 any cloud can write tools that read that manifest file, and from that manifest file, uh, go build the right Azure resources or, or cloud resources. In my case, AZD, I'm going to do AZD init. Uh, so when you right click in Visual Studio and publish, it's actually doing this underneath the covers for you. We, you know, it, one of our goals with the reboot of .NET back in uh, .NET Core 1.0 was to make sure that anything you could do, we should do from the command line first. So no matter if you're on Windows, Mac, or Linux, it works. And our tools can wrap that. Uh, but there's always a command line way of doing stuff. And so I'm going to type azd init. And it's going to say, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to select a template? In my case, I'm going to say, use the code in the current, current directory. It's going to go scan my folder. And what it's doing is it's looking to see if it can fire, find that Aspire manifest. When it finds the Aspire manifest, that's when it's going to know this is an Aspire project. And uh, from that manifest, I know how to create the right stuff. So it says, hey, I, I just determined I found an Aspire app. Do you want to continue? And I'll say CSA, CSH Oslo um, for my app. Um, and so it, a bunch of stuff just happened. It said it generated an Azure.yaml. It generated a nextstep.md. Um, and so if I go look here, I can, I can load those up. Um, I'm not yet going to load them up, but let's well let's go look look at these things for a second. So, if there's any, if there's any um, DevOps people in the in the in the room, uh, you know, 
Notice there's an, there's an Azure folder here. Um, inside of it, it's got some stuff. Um, but more interesting, let's go see. There's an Azure YAML. And all it really says is, hey, I found an app called uh, Aspire. Um, and uh, it's got a, a few things here. So there's a next steps here that's interesting. It, it will tell you all the things that we just generated. Uh, but one of the cool things about the next steps is if I scroll down here, see what was added, infrastructure for configuration, single service. Um, it's going to tell you all the stuff that it kind of did behind the scenes. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so one of the things that happens is when I run these tools is um, we go and uh, generate some, some stuff for you. You might be curious. We, we actually hide the stuff we generate by default. But notice there's a command here, at azd infrasent, and I'm going to run that. And what that does is that tells uh, the azd thing, don't be secretive. Go write the files that you created to make this thing work. Um, since it's an alpha state, how can it be an alpha state? Um, and now I have an infra folder. And inside of infra, the infra folder, I'm going to have these bicep files uh, and resources.bicep that actually describe all the stuff that we're going to create in Azure for you. We wanted to have this available because I know DevOps people are like, I'm not going to use this to publish my application. I'm going to have my own tech to do this. And so we want you to have access to all the bicep stuff that we create to make this work. Um, and then I can just do an azd up. And uh, you can see I have way too many subscriptions. We'll just go to my, my subscription. It's going to ask me where I want to publish this. I'll say East US. Um, and it's going to publish this. Uh, now, a cool aspect of Aspire is you saw that dashboard. And while this is happening, I might, I'm going to do a, a different dashboard demo. That dashboard is not necessarily a .NET dashboard. That dashboard, all it really is, is a dashboard that understands open telemetry. And so when I do this publish to Azure, it's going to, go to, it's going to create an Azure container environment. It's going to put the app in an Azure uh, container app. Uh, it's also going to publish the dashboard for me as well. So even my app running in the cloud, I'm going to have access to that exact same dashboard. I don't have to go and turn a bunch of stuff on. I can see if my app is crashing, if it's retrying, all those things live in the cloud right out of the gate. The only negative of the dashboard, the dashboard doesn't have storage, which means it's not going to have like seven days worth of information. It's only going to have what it can keep in memory, and so it's going to be the last couple of hours of your data. If you want more information than that, that's when you would actually go use something like, in, in Azure, you would use things like App Insights, which will also look at all the open telemetry, uh, and we have support for that here as well, and that will keep as much telemetry as you want. So while that's running and waiting for that to happen, Let's talk about that dashboard, the fact that dashboard is disconnected. So let me go and, and do a fun demo of the dashboard. So let's open another terminal here. And um, I'm going to steal a, a chunk of stuff that's too much to type. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start the dashboard in a container on my local machine. And now um, the dashboard works automatically in Visual Studio or VS Code. Um, because the tool knows what it's doing. Um, the dashboard is secure. The, you notice I was seeing environment variables. We don't want that dashboard to be public. We want it to have authentication. And so if I want to run it locally outside of Visual Studio, uh, in this case, I need to go to Docker. Here's my dashboard running. I can see it booted up. And you're going to notice here that it actually gave me a, a, uh, a login here uh, that I should be able to click. It won't work, but that's fine. Um, should be able to click. But the thing, I, actually, I don't really care about the, this aspect of it. I care about this key right here. So let's, let's do something. Let's go and, and just do the local host here. Yeah, I know the app's not running. So here's the dashboard. Now I need that access token. So let's go find the access token again. Grab the access token. 
And this is, this is important because, you know, we're talking about Aspire here. So now I have a dashboard running. Um, this dashboard works with WinForms, WPF, console, any .NET project. It, as I said before, it's an open telemetry dashboard. It doesn't really care uh, of the actual underlying tech. And so I can switch from this project to another project. And all this is is a console application. Um, but the console application can use the dashboard. So here uh, is, my, is, my, is my program CS. And you're going to notice that here's the same kind of stuff. I'm adding open telemetry to my console application. You can add open telemetry to your console application, as I said before, a WinForm project, any project, and use the dashboard for local development. So in this case, if I run this, this console application, um, and I hope that we actually add this default by default to all of our projects in the long run. There will be a checkbox saying when you create a WinForm project, do you want telemetry? Uh, WPF project, do you want telemetry? And it hooks to the dashboard. If I run this app, and it's, it's a simple console app that literally goes out and, and uh, runs some queries on NuGet. Um, so that was not exciting. Uh, but if I come back over to my browser, you can see all the telemetry from that app, all the output of what it was doing is all right here. So you can take that logger technology that we built into ASP.NET Core, put it in any application, have great telemetry. And so uh, I think that's a cool aspect of the, of the technology. Let's go see how we're doing over here. Still going. So while that's still going, Let's, let's talk about something else. So uh, we know a lot of customers, when they build applications, they might build an application that is uh, using a front-end technology different than Blazor. They might use React. They might use Vue. Um, does Aspire work with those types of projects? And the answer is, of course it does. Um, we want Aspire to be everything, everywhere. So um, let's jump out of the console project. And we'll go back here. And I've got an Aspire JavaScript project. And so once again, um, what this is going to be is this is going to be I've got my minimal API back end here. Uh, you know, once again, our boring weather endpoints. So I've got APIs written in .NET. Um, but I want to actually use things like React, Vue, Angular for this. Um, and so now you're going to notice in my builder, instead of actually adding a project or a container, I'm adding an NPM app. NPM app, giving it a name again, and giving it a folder where the actual application is. And uh, we're smart enough to actually know how to boot that up and, and uh, start those things up. And notice, it'll publish it as a Docker file. This'll, these apps, I can publish these the apps to the cloud just like I could the other application. Um, and so let's run this. And then I'll show you the magic uh, here as well. OK, so now notice that these are executables. They're no longer um, projects. They're executables. So we can run containers. We can run executables. We can run projects. We can run a lot of things in Aspire. And now, if I click on one of these, there's the Angular version. There's the React version. There's the Vue version. And you might ask, how, how does that work? And uh, it works the same way I described before. So let's go look at one of these applications. Uh, let's go here. And I'm going to look at my, let's, well, it doesn't really matter which one. I'm going to go again. Let's go look at these environment variables. Because you're going to ask, the question I would ask here is, how does that view application, how does it know how to find the .NET project? How does it know the port and IP address of the .NET project? Same kind of model here. Notice we have this uh, services weather API, these environment variables. And so what we did, if I go and just come back here, let's dig in the folder here. Let me shut this down now. Let's 
go check. Oh, ooh, look at that. Our dashboard is published. Awesome. So let's go to source. Spire samples. Go to samples. Go to Aspire with JavaScript. And you're going to notice in here, you saw, um, if you look there, you can see I've got the various framework uh, right there, the, the Angular, the, the uh, React, the Vue. If I came and did a find in files, um, you're going to notice this is how we actually tell those apps to go use that, in sa that same naming convention to go grab those environment variables that we inject in so they can actually find the API um, and you get all those same kind of hookups that you saw before uh, in the .NET apps. So let's go and take a look at the, uh, the app we have running. So um, notice that when it, when it uh, started this, it gave me the endpoint for my, my cache, the endpoint for my API, the endpoint for my retry application. And, and just to prove a point, if I click the uh, API, nope. Remember, we didn't make that one public. That's not going to work. If I go and click the AP, the, uh, the retry app, this one should work. Ah, good. And I mentioned before, that same dashboard runs in the cloud. Oops, open two of those. Here is my live dashboard showing my container, my fail API, my retry app. If I go again and look at those details of this, I scroll down and find those endpoints. Here's my, my connection string to my Redis cache. Notice this is now other. It's because we're using different tech to actually do that authentication. I'll explain that in a second as well. If I scroll down here. What project am I on? I miss. Um, it'll have the, uh, oh, there's the endpoint. Ah, here's what I was looking for. Now you can see those endpoints are actually in Azure. So I don't have to worry about those things changing. If I republish the app, I'm good. I just reference those things with the name. It all just works. Um, and then I get my structured logs and my traces, just like before. You can see we had errors here, and it retried, just like we would expect. Um, and so you get the exact same experience in the cloud as you have local, and I think that's really cool. Um, OK. Let's show one more thing real quick, and then I can come back and, and, and show two more things, actually. So first off, um, I want to talk about complicated applications. and so. Um, we ported the eShop sample that we wrote years ago uh, to be Aspire. And so you saw me playing with simple applications, doing some retries and stuff like this. This stuff is designed for big, complicated projects. So if you look over here, my Solution Explorer is now full of tons of stuff. I've got projects. I'm using RabbitMQ. I'm using a bunch of stuff. If I come and drill down over here into my um, program.cs, Notice now that my, my app is super complicated. I've got uh, a Redis, a RabbitMQ, I've got a Postgres. I've got each of these projects all running. I've got an identity API, endpoints, catalogs. I've got stuff everywhere. Um, and so Aspire, thank you. Aspire is great for running complicated applications. And once again, you'll have that same publish that I mentioned before. Before, we never, you had to right click on every project and publish it. With Aspire, you'll not have to do that. We basically know the entire app is a distributed app. The same AZD, init, AZD up would publish the, this application just like it published um, this, my simple app that I was playing before. And so now you can see this is my dashboard. I've now got a lot of stuff in here, a lot of projects. Um, I've got my event bus. My Postgres, my Redis, the event bus is, is my um, uh, RabbitMQ, um, and uh, stuff everywhere. 
And so here I am. You can click the web app. And now you saw how fast that thing started. I've actually got this nine project, nine container thing running, uh, working on my local machine. I did publish this to Azure as well. Um, we'll see if the tool cooperates with us. It's a big project. If I, uh, if I right click over here, not, not there. If I right click here and I, um, I come here and do publish, what you're going to see, um, I've already done this before. It knows I've done it. Notice it's got my account. It's got my name, my subscription. Uh, this is going to take a while. What it actually does, and I actually published this in Sweden, um, what it's doing right here is it's actually going to go and query all of the parts of the application, and they're going to show up in the publish pane, and I can click on any one I want to see uh, to get access to them directly in Azure. And as I mentioned, this, th this tech will work with AWS as well. So um, for fun, as I said, I did, I did publish this to the cloud already, and I will show a version of this running in the cloud too. Let's go and look at uh, resource groups, and we'll see CSH. Here's eShop. And uh, we can do th fun things like resource visualizer. And that's too hard to even see, but that it shows you this tech is great for publishing complicated, complex applications to the cloud. Um, there's a couple things to highlight here, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight them in a different project. So I've got a, uh, one more project that I can load here. We'll let that try to, try to finish itself. We'll see if it finishes. Um, it's got to go query all of those projects. There's a lot of projects. I want to open one more project that I already published to Azure. Let's do open project or solution. Let's go to source. And I have this Aspire with services. And I just want to show a couple things here. So the Aspire Services is an app that in this case, notice that I, I added, um, this is really cool. I, I needed to use Azure Storage for this application. And so I said builder.add add, add Azure Storage, gave it a name. I'm going to reference storage, no connection strings. But notice that I have run as emulator. What that means is on my local machine, I'm going to run that in an emulator versus actually, because I can't, there is no Azure storage I can actually run on my local machine. So a variety of things. Cosmos DB has a run as emulator. Uh, storage has a run as emulator. Um, and then I add my blob to it. And so I have a great Control F5 local story. We boot up a container with the emulator. Once again, we're not going to put the emulator on your, your, on your machine. We're just going to run that in a, in a container. Um, and I've already published this to the cloud. And, it, it's, and I really want to show this app in the cloud. It's a much easier app than this. Let's go Aspire with services. And if you go look at my resources, um, it's very simple. It's got my container app environment. That's where my containers go. It's got my main application running in the container. Actually, the web app's down here. This is the dashboard up here. Uh, sorry, this is the registry. Uh, notice it's got a managed identity and a storage account. So the other cool thing about Aspire is when you publish your tech to Azure, we do whatever is the best practice. So in the case of a storage account, um, I don't want to have a connection string ever. I want my storage account and my web application to be able to talk to each other. We have a technology in Azure called Managed Identity, where you configure it in the cloud that the container app is allowed to see the storage account. When you do that, there is no place, no way for a secret to ever be stolen, because there is no secret at all. Um, and so when you, when you add an Azure component to Aspire, we actually will use whatever the best practice is. If you need something that does require a connection string, it will actually automatically add an Azure Key Vault for you. And it will use the Key Vault uh, to store the connection strings. But once again, you don't ever worry about that. All you do is, once again, use the name that you declared for the, the asset you want. So in my, in my app here, uh, in my client application, all I would actually do is reference the uh, storage 
in quotes when I use the storage SDK, and it will convert that to whatever uh, it needs to be converted to, whether it's managed identity, a connection string in Key Vault. Uh, it's, just, it's just magic. And uh, let me just try this real quick. See if I can run it locally. And I'll show you what, it, what happens when I run it locally. This one might be mad for a second because I don't have the uh, emulator on this local machine. You can see locally, Azure resource, connection strings, save to user secrets. On my local machine, it's using a user secret. When I publish to Azure, it's going to use the, uh, the managed identity. Um, and if I go um, look in my dashboard, nope, too many windows. Uh, you're going to see here's the uh, Azure blobs. It's starting up in a container. Um, and so once again, I'm showing you all these things. There it goes, just booted up. Um, never touch your local machine. Never have to install anything on your local machine. So um, I will go back over here. And uh, highlights I want to make here is number one, you should have seen, easy to get started, right click on any project that you already have, add Aspire support to it, does not require rewriting your applications, you get the dashboard, you get the telemetry, you get all the service defaults by default. You saw how easy it was to build, um, and you saw how easy it was to deploy. I could right click in Visual Studio, I could go to the command prompt and do an ACD up, that just works like that. Um, we have two great ways of running your Aspire apps in, uh, in Azure, Azure Container Apps, which is based on Kubernetes, but we don't actually give you the, the, the actual dashboard for Kubernetes. We actually manage the Kubernetes for you. It's the simplest and easiest way to, to build an app and run an app uh, in Azure. But we also have um, uh, their support in uh, Aspire for running an AKS as well. If you really want all the knobs and, 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 and things you can do in the uh, AKS world, that's available. I, uh, I mentioned before, um, this is using uh, behind the scenes all the publishing tech is using ACD. Uh, you can go to aka.ms slash AZ, uh, and that will actually, actually that's a typo, that should be AZD. Um, and uh, that will bring you uh, the information on how the, uh, the, the uh, developer CLI works. Um, Visual Studio will, I think, will install it for you automatically, but I, I just do it from, from, from Terminal. And um, we already did the demos. And so um, what I would tell you is, Grab the latest Visual Studio. It'll bring all the Aspire tech down. Um, you can also, if you're, if you're a VS Code person, full support for Aspire existing VS Code. Uh, all you've got to do is go to your command prompt and say install uh, .NET workload install Aspire. That will install Aspire on your machine. And then you can basically start doing a .NET new Aspire uh, and do it all in Visual Studio Code on a Mac. Um, you know, get your first app running in container apps in minutes. Go show your boss. Uh, and get showered in awe and amazement. So uh, anyways, thanks for having me this morning. Uh, thanks for being at uh, NDC. Uh, please try Aspire, and I'll be around the whole day to, to, for, to answer any questions. Thank you so, thanks so much.